Now, Nish, thank you so much for being here. What a treat. Uh, before we start, right, as you might not know, when, when I record these, I usually record them privately in my house or whatever, and I will say to the guest, you know, I don't want to make you look like a prick. Like, if, if you say something you regret, we'll just say we'll cut it. Uh, uh, and if I ask you anything too personal, just say, can we cut it? And we'll cut it. But um, Or, but as uh, uh, sometimes happens, we do the podcast, I think it's absolutely fine, and then you and I spend two and a half years getting uh, weird tweets from people going, Woody Allen technically wasn't her stepfather. That is true. That is true. <laughs> and you, you, have, you have to think to yourself, if you're reaching for the line, he technically wasn't her stepfather, <laughs> you've already lost the argument. So because we have witnesses tonight, <laughs> I guess we need a safe word. So if I say anything that makes you uncomfortable, just say bread rolls. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so we have... <laughs> <laughs> so it's a big one tonight, isn't it? Exciting. It you is and me, a big one. films of the decade. Now, the, the rules. Third, this is part three, isn't it? This is part three. You've come back to life. Uh, last year we did films of the year, but this year we're doing films of the decade. Now, some of you may know I'm very strict on this. I mean, technically, this is bullshit because the decade has not finished and none of us have seen cats yet. <laughs> <laughs> so. Has anyone seen cats? So whatever we say oh, this, is, this, is moot. This, sorry, there's one person who has, like, has seen cats, and she currently has her head in her hands. <laughs> so, I mean... But she has been that way since she saw it. <laughs> she, she's now doing a motion where she's sort of cutting her own throat, <laughs> which, I mean, is one of the worst reviews of anything. <laughs> um, so this is films of the decade up to Jan December 19th. Yeah, so we haven't seen Little Women. No, Little Women we haven't seen. We haven't seen Cats. Well, and um, also we, I have seen Parasite, uh, but that you have said that exists outside. Count. It doesn't get a UK release date, so it's not admissible. But I can Sorry, assure guys. you. Sorry, guys. Rules are rules. <laughs> He's a stickler for them. Yeah, that's why I've got a clipboard. Um, <laughs> so, oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. Oh, Nish. <laughs> Fuck me. What is it, Brett? Ah. <laughs> Brett, whatever oh, this news Nish. is, ah. whatever this news is, it's really taking its toll on uh, you. I've forgotten to tell you something. What? Uh, it's mental. I didn't tell you this. Given everything we've been through, you've come <laughs> back to life, everything. <laughs> Fuck, I'll just say it. Uh, you've died again. <laughs> you died again. <laughs> Listen, the thing is, uh, I know that it seems weird that I keep coming back to life, but ultimately, I was raised a Hindu, and this is just... <laughs> you are the only guest I could do this with. Yeah, this really? is just <laughs> reincarnation. We have, like, 500 gods, some of them are blue, it's like X-Men, and you can keep coming back to life. <laughs> <laughs> it's the absolute dream. Uh, how did you die this week? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this time, I think I... Probably, I think. I think last time I died, it was because I said I was. I was. Get, I got run over because I was listening to a podcast, most likely myself on this podcast. <laughs> um, I think. I think this time. I think this time, so, like somebody chucks a bread roll at me, <laughs> but aims it a bit more accurately than the, <laughs> without wishing to editorialize fucking idiot who <laughs> threw it at me last time uh, who, uh, managed, who managed to miss me from very close range. Um, yeah, this time somebody throws uh, a bread roll at me but it, it gets me in the eye right. and I trip backwards and fall off the stage and break my neck. And the problem is there is a sort of palpable air of tragedy about it because I'm a life that's been claimed really by the culture war but also it's very funny. Yeah. <laughs> The I'm worst sorry. part is that lot finally enjoyed the gig. <laughs> <laughs> he is funny. Yeah, and so everyone ha it's one of those funerals where everyone kind of has to be like, oh, oh, it's tragic, but at the end of the day, he got hit by bread and tripped to death. <laughs> it is tragic, but let's watch it again. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe my death went viral. Yeah. Um, so, shall we start? Yeah. All right. So... Expert hosting. This, this is the sort of authority that can only come with a clipboard. Uh, without that clipboard, I'm nothing. Uh, this, yes. Kumar. Brett Goldstein. What is the first film you saw January 1st? 
2010. The thing is, there have definitely been years this decade where I've either seen something that came out... So I've seen something on New Year's Day or the 2nd of January, yeah. or I've seen something that's released on the 2nd of January, but I've gone... If I'm like in, if you're in London over Christmas, there's very often like previews because they're just like, well, I'll put anything on. <laughs> there's, there's literally no one here. It's like, yeah. I am legend. Um, <laughs> But um, I, but I, in 2010, I was really trying to work out, based on the release dates, what it might have been. My guess, or certainly the film that I saw that was released in January 2010, that certainly left a mark on me, yeah. was A Prophet. I think that's my answer. I think we went together. <laughs> <laughs> great poster. Really, really not great for the podcast Seen listeners, it? but... Good film. It's uh, it's quite it's quite an extraordinary movie, and it's it's sort of about a guy who's a French kid who is um, has had a series of offences as a young person, and now he's turned eighteen and he's committed another crime, and so he can be properly tried and put in jail. And he ends up going to jail. And listen, as a subgenre of movie, I absolutely love a long film that documents the rise of someone through a criminal organisation. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, please. The, the longer, the better. The Irishman, I was erect oh, yeah. for the last half of that film. <laughs> oh, I couldn't believe it. The, the, this, the Irishman is basically like, and it's weird that they CGI'd him to look like a baby at the beginning. That's a deleted scene that some of you might not have seen. But I, the, I really, it's a sub-genre of film I really, really love. And it, this, the movie is great. It's a really, yeah. really good film. It's got a really uh, disturbing scene where he has to uh, put. A, I mean, it's what, where he has to put a um, razor in his mouth. It, I mean, it. it's one of the most horrible scenes. Yeah. And like, and he has to set up to basically suck a dude off. Yeah. And then ends up stabbing him in the throat. Yeah. And then he keeps on being. I don't want to give too much away because there they didn't seem to be the universal uptake. Yeah. For who has not seen a prophet? Oh, don't. Oh wow. That? Oh, I thought that was a much more. Yeah. Popular. <laughs> it's Don't uh, worry, guys. We'll get to the Avengers. <laughs> Jesus. Scorsese would be turning in Jimmy Hoffa's grave. I know what you're thinking. BFI, they'll all be... But no. <laughs> not at all. It's, it's a really exceptional film by Jack Odiard, who's uh, also a French director who, let me tell you, wears some superb hats. And... <laughs> It's, uh, he made a really, really great movie called The Beat That My Heart Skipped, which I think Ooh. was b was before A Prophet. Yeah. Then he made a film called Rust and Bone, which if you go with Rust and Bone, if you are prepared to accept that the crux of this movie is a woman's legs get eaten by a whale, if you are prepared to accept that, it is a very stark and brilliant and really quite emotionally wrought film. Yeah. It's really, honestly, now, listen, by yeah. the sounds of things, we've got some non-believers in the room. <laughs> And it plays a very subtle love scene to Fireworks by Katy Perry. Yeah, it? that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it does. I it know. Does. I know. It sounds like Stick Brett and I. Stick with it. Stick with it. I know. It sounds like Brett and I have made up a film <laughs> hastily on the spot. Um, but yes. Yeah, it is a really, and he has to sort of navigate the kind of racial dynamics of the prison, and there's a the French gangsters and the Corsican gangsters, and the movie happens across a couple of different languages and. It's an extraordinary film about how someone can go into jail being quite a bad person, but absolutely redeemable, and come out of it a, a proper villain. Yeah. And it's a really interesting character study of how uh, the sort of corruption of an innocent. It's also my answer for sexiest film. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> Did you like it? I love it. I think it's fucking brilliant. And it's so tense. I love a film that's really tense, yeah. but long. Yeah, and, you yeah. think, <laughs> and you think, how can I be this tense <laughs> for so long? And at the end, you're like, I can't stand up. I've been so tense. Yeah, and, it, and, and the thing is, it does ratchet up. I think also because, you, because it's a well-made, well-acted film, regardless of how bad this guy's behavior starts to turn as he kind of rises through the ranks of the prison criminal organization, you start, you identify with him more and more because you saw him when he was a child. There's a really interesting exercise in building empathy with criminals because you see him when he's essentially a child. And so you have this fondness for him. Mm. And so uh, you, there's, there's this escalating tension and the final, the sort of shootout element of it 
is absolutely incredible. Mm. It's really great. Sources spoiled the ending, but it's um, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's really good. It's like The Wire, but slightly quicker. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It is. That is a perfect <laughs> The Wire. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Nish Kumar, uh, what was the scariest film you saw this decade? So when I did this podcast, the the normal episode of it, yeah, I gave Your I think a very day. sort of wry answer. Uh, but I do think there is a grain of truth in it. And the first one I said was Inside Lewin Davis. And the reason I mm. said it was the scariest film is because if you're, an, if you're in any way a performer and you watch Inside Lewin Davis, you are essentially watching your parents' worst case scenario of how your <laughs> life could have turned out. And also, I bear a passing resemblance. And I do mean passing, really. <laughs> really. <laughs> I do mean passing on the Millennium Falcon at light speed. <laughs> to Oscar Isaac. Like, I do look a bit like, and I don't wish to toot my own horn here, but a fire-damaged Oscar Isaac. <laughs> like a dented Isaac. That's <laughs> sort of my vibe. And so, I, I, and, and also I love uh, the music of Bob Dylan, and it's it, it, one of my favorite films of all time. And I did say that that was the thing that, but, I, but you know, I, I don't want to be too cute with some of these answers. Uh, this is really the first- Stop being so cute. <laughs> I can't help it, guys. <laughs> I'm Lightspeed Isaac. <laughs> um, I, so I, but this is the first decade I've really properly got into watching horror films. You know me. You know I, don't, I didn't really used to like them because I get too scared. Very easily scared. Yeah, very easily scared. But this is the first decade I've properly started watching horror, horror movies. And I've enjoyed like some of the trashier Bloomhouse offerings. Yeah. I've had a great time watching Happy Death Day to You, oh, which yeah. was, is one of the most willfully stupid films. <laughs> and I do truly mean that as a compliment. It is an absolute... If you haven't seen Happy Death Day or Happy Death Day to you, I don't want to use the phrase three colours, but if they do hit a third one, we are talking about one of the great movie trilogies of all time. I don't even know what, like, Happy Death Day 3 me... Like, I don't know what sort of pun they could incorporate into it. But this is the first sort of decade that I've properly really like got into watching horror films. Uh, and the, 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 I've, I've really enjoyed the kind of fun, goofy ones. The two that have properly terrified me beyond belief are the two Ari Aster movies. Yeah, correct. So Hereditary and Midsummer or Midsommar, to give it its phonetically correct title. Now, I'll be honest with you. Here's the thing about Midsummer. It's, I am scared of large groups of white people. <laughs> Full stop. If the last 10 years, or indeed the entire span of human history, has taught us nothing, it's that when large groups of white people get together, and it's only white people, and they all wear robes, nothing good happens. I think they were fine people on both sides. <laughs> Come on, Nish. <laughs> <laughs> I love Donald Trump's review of Midsummer. <laughs> Guys, they built that big yellow pyramid, didn't they? <laughs> that was a feat of construction. <laughs> um, I, Midsummer, I had to watch chunks of it through my sweater because I was genuinely... Uh, Hereditary, I think, I found, I found Hereditary almost sort of more upsetting because Hereditary feels like a more, I don't know, this, Hereditary is so much about the grief of losing people. Also, I will say this for Hereditary, one of the great misdirects of any trailer that I've ever seen. Yes. The trailer makes it look like you are watching a film about the grief of one character, and it absolutely missells who that character is. And the first time I saw it, in my, I saw it on, uh, I want to say DVD, whatever the, the DVD that's in the internet, whatever that's called. <laughs> I saw it on a in DVD a inside in the head? internet, whatever yeah. it is. <laughs> 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 Who says I can't relate to boomers? The DVD inside the internet, I watched it on one of them, um, and I, it, it, somehow, even though lots of people, including you, had seen the film and talked to me about it quite a lot, quite l length, you'd somehow kept the secret of the movie. And it is absolutely incredible when you realise what you're watching. Th I, now, that, all, all of that being said, I, Midsummer, I had to stop, like, I had to physically look away. 
it made me physically unwell. There is mm. a bit where people... It, oh, God. <laughs> it's people... Is this... how? Where are we with spoilers here? I mean, I sort of always say, go for it, but then I don't want to ruin anyone's Christmas. So... <laughs> If if you go, oh, you just got to put your hand up. Go, I really want to see that film. Please don't. Then what? Go, go for, for it. it. Okay. There's, All okay. Right. The scene, the first when you, the whole time something has gone awry in this movie and Ari Aster's fucking life. <laughs> the whole well, during Hereditary, I actually shouted, "What is wrong with this bloke?" Yeah. Something is wrong with this bloke. Yeah. He's not well. He no. needs to see a therapist. Mm -hmm. This shit is disgusting. Yeah. And there is a bit in Midsummer where from the beginning, the image of the way the parents are killed, mm. uh, I, was, I was watching that being like, great, well, that's with me until I die. <laughs> great, that's burned into my retinas. Oh, I'm so yeah. excited to have that, to see that flash before my eyes <laughs> before I meet my maker, only to be reincarnated so I can do Brett's podcast again. <laughs> um, so already it's the most horrible thing I've ever seen. Then there is a scene where the first time you realize things are really fucking weird, when these two old people essentially commit Harry Keary, and they jump, the way they do it is not like, pop, pop a little pill in your mouth. <laughs> but you know, the way they do it is they jump off a massive cliff onto a sharp rock. Now, face the way first. you see it, yeah, face, face first. first. Now, the way that you see it is that they, you see them take the step, and fall, and at every point you're going, cut away, cut away, cut away, cut away, cut away, cut away. He's gonna cut away. Then they go face first into the rock, and it zooms in. And they bounce, they bounce. Yeah, oh! It is. And some blood comes out as they bounce, and then you think, well, I won't have to see the damage. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will. Yes, you very much will, because Ari Aster is not well. Fuck, like. <laughs> It's fucking horrible. Also, uh, he consistently says it's his breakup film. I'm like, if I'm his ex, <laughs> <laughs> and I watch that, I'm like, I'm so sorry. Whatever I did, <laughs> please don't hurt me. <laughs> you talk to me about Midsummer and Hereditary as someone who I would say has a much better sense of the history of horror yeah. than I do. Yeah. What What's your feeling about it? Because some people I know who really love horror don't love these films as much or certainly didn't quite didn't like hereditary as much uh, i think he's he, he's amazing yeah but i think it's because he's got the reason i find it is because he's emotional with him mm. he's not he uh, the same thing that happens in hereditary and in, in midsummer the way he films people being upset yeah. is really upsetting and so then you're just in it you just care too much so when people are getting their faces spiked <laughs> it's like Horrible because you 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 bloody invested now. Yeah, yeah. In Happy Death Day to you, it's a yeah, laugh. Yeah, yeah. It is a Someone laugh. Someone gets their head smashed in. It's like oh, all good fun, but in this, <laughs> there's terrible. a shot in Hereditary when she's in the group therapy, and the camera sort of does this thing where it manages to sort of I don't even know it must be on a crane or something, but it's indoors and it yeah. sort of dives from over the top of the rest of yeah. the group, and you sort of. You sort of slowly plunge towards. It's like being on a sort of. I mean, it's literally an emotional roller coaster. I just realised yeah. as I <gasps> said this. You climb up, and then you're sort of looking down onto this sort of stricken. Oh, and what he also, puts. What he puts Muriel through. <laughs> oh, this, you, that was terrible, Muriel. <laughs> that was genuinely. It was genuine, Muriel. That was fucking horrible, <laughs> Muriel. Muriel, make it Jesus stop. Jesus fucking Christ, Muriel. <laughs> Uh, Muriel fucking hell! <laughs> but also there are points where it almost becomes, when they're, uh, in Midsummer, when they're having sex and those mm. old ladies are pushing his butt into the woman, yeah. that is also funny. Like, funny. It's it, funny. It was weird, but it's almost like it's pitched at a tone of such like operatic hysteria that it rides this really odd line between being genuinely v viscerally upsetting and also a bit funny. There's also, they take acid, and mm. when she's not happy, that stressed me out so <laughs> fucking much. They arrive in this field, and her boyfriend, who she's not having a great time with, she's not happy, she's in grief, she's upset, and then everyone goes, should we do some acid? And I'm like, definitely not. And then <laughs> everyone's like, yeah, and she's like, oh, I feel a bit dark, actually, probably not a good idea for me. And they go, oh, 
And then she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, this is fucked now. <laughs> I've done acid once. Is that illegal? I don't know. Shh, but, uh, bread rolls. But, um, uh, you can't bread roll yourself. <laughs> and uh, uh, someone made me watch Pi whilst on acid. Yeah. I mean, you, basically, 12 hours later, I was like, oh, well, I'm, I'm mad now. For, um, I guess this is me. Uh, I now live here in mad. Uh, I must call my mother and try to explain where I am. I mean, I was in my room, but I must explain that I'm now, I live in mad <laughs> because of pie. Such a stressful film. Why would you, I mean, I've never done acid because I am very frightened of all drugs. <laughs> but, I, even, but even I know that that is not a good combination yeah. of narcotic and activity. I try these things. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's the title of your that's the title of your new podcast where you do really ill advised things. It's Brett Goldstein with you gotta uh, try these things. Try these things yeah. Some um, discount bungee jumping. Yeah. Too easy. <laughs> uh, my uh, scariest film of the decade is the film Wiener. <laughs> uh, have you seen Wiener? Wiener is a documentary. Uh, <laughs> about a, a New York senator who is running for mayor. Now, it is all true. He genuinely could win mayor. He is good. He is good for the world. He is a good senator. The problem is he can't stop sending pictures of his dick <laughs> to people. His human name is Wiener. <laughs> and he has been, at the beginning of the film, there's been a scandal. He sent pictures of his knob to people. He's apologized. He's running for mayor again. New York's behind him. They're like, do you know what? Because you are good for the world. You've just got a little sort of addiction to showing your knob to people. His wife, who seems like a lovely woman, she stands by him on the campus. She says, you know, that's in the past. And he's doing his campaign. He's working so hard. He's good for the world. But he keeps... <laughs> <laughs> he, can't, he can't stop texting his knob to people. And, like, I think I find it so scary because... I worry. Yeah, I actually, I hate to jump in here, Brett. Um, what have you, um, what, what have you, you got to share with the group? <laughs> what if you, like, what I, the bit I sort of want to, I want to say to him, I want to say to him, if this is your thing, and I don't judge, everyone has their thing, text your wife. Yeah. Text your wife, your dick, that yeah. you keep, it's the same dick as well. I don't know why you think this is new information that you're sending out. <laughs> it's the same dick. The dick has been on the news. Yeah. And he could win, but he just, it's like, do save the world or text my dick. And it's so close for him. Now, it just to be clear, Brett, decide. this frightens you. Just to be clear, yeah. and I feel like I'm speaking as your legal <laughs> representation here, but just to be clear, the reason you are frightened of this film yeah. is you feel... It, what through if? real <laughs> events, through real events, you see the the dramatization of the dialogue between a man and his penis. Aren't like, can we, you can you do well? Aren't we all wiener? <laughs> <laughs> Red, in the end, I've got to be honest with you. I don't think we're all wiener. <laughs> I don't think this ends with like hashtag just we wiener. <laughs> The horror is his wife as well, because she stands by him. She goes on that he's a good man, and I love him. And at the end of the day, it's not, it's not bad. He just loves, he loves it. And the thing I don't get, <laughs> I have never met a human being, and I will throw this to the audience. Has a woman in this room ever enjoyed receiving a picture of someone's dick? No. And yet it keeps happening. Yeah, I don't, I just don't know. I just don't. That's I mean, a I understand, horror. I understand that there are like solicited pictures that are passed between consenting adults. And that's, but that's a different thing. But is there a story out there where you're like, hey, how did you meet your husband? And you're like, yeah. he just sent me a picture of his dick on the internet. <laughs> now, I have, for the record, not yet ever sent a picture of my dick out. The night is young, but I have never... <laughs> I don't understand men who think, I send a dick, yeah. when the clear consensus is, no one wants it, <laughs> even if you're going to be mayor. 
but there also is never the, the time. And then there's like there's there's so many layers to this story because in the summer I first became aware of this because I was watching the Daily Show. That was the summer John Stewart went away to make the film, and he was covered by John Oliver, the poor man's Nish Kumar, as he's known. <laughs> By no one. <laughs> and he had this whole thing because one of the, the pseudonym that Wiener used, because, I mean, when your name is already essentially Richard Dick, you, ed, you have to create... He, he decided to create a pseudonym. The pseudonym he chose was Carlos Danger. <laughs> and, but the thing is, this movie has very, very serious repercussions for it, which sort of happen after the film ends. Like, you think the film is scary. The consequences of the film are arguably even more scary because his wife is a woman called Huma Abedin, who was Hillary Clinton's number two woman. Like, the two of them were married. There's a bit in the film where they show a photo of their wedding, and the person officiating it was Bill Clinton. You're like, well, you've okay. never had a fucking chance. Like, but Huma Abedin was I working with Hillary I thought you were going to say, and he Clinton. had his dick out in the wedding yeah. photo. <laughs> Yeah, it's from the waist up. <laughs> but yeah, but Humor Abedin's computer was seized because Wiener sent one of the pictures and there was a picture and it was, I think it was sent to a girl who was underage. Oh and certainly there was, another, there was certainly a problem where he sent a picture while he was holding his child's son. Oh, keep it see, light, yeah. son. So basically, they seized his computer, uh, they seized Humor Abedin's computer and on that computer were correspondences with Hillary Clinton that resulted in the FBI reopening in the investigation into Hillary Clinton in the lead up to the 2016 presidential election. The final round of FBI investigations started because of investigations that began to, into Humor Abedin's computer because of Anthony Weiner's dick. And a that, my friend, is why it is a yeah. fucking horror film. <laughs> and, and so I commend you on your choice, Rhett. <laughs> Bloody hell! <laughs> that took a turn. Uh, right, let's get let's get back on to uh, what is the film that made you cry the mostest? But well, do you want to answer this one first? So we very okay. Up? Um, you and, well, you and I are both criers. Yeah, we're pathetic. No, no, I think that's not that's not necessarily fair to say. You and I are men incapable of expressing our emotions, and so we have to do it through the conduit of cinema. Yeah, and what, what the truth is, when I say I'm pathetic and, and cry, never in front of anyone. <laughs> so what I do is take myself to the cinema on my own, at a time I think not many people will be there, <laughs> sit at the back and cry. Now, the film that fucked me up yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, was Saving Mr. Banks. Yeah, I, I do. I know this about you, Brett. This was a real hard one for you. What it was, was it? Oh, what was it about... I've seen Saving Mr. Banks. I, thought, I, I understand it, yeah. was, it had some... Wait to it, and I did enjoy it. I thought Tom yeah. Hanks and Emma Thompson were great. What was it about it that pushed any it any story with a dad? Forget it. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Add to that Mary Poppins, which the original Mary Poppins is about the dad. Yeah. Then stay the story of the making of the film about the dad. There's another dad. That's double dads. <laughs> that's dad squared. This is dad. This is dad inception. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's the Easter eggs of dads all the way through it, plus Tom Hanks, who we all wish was our dad. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a dad three, I don't know what three squared is. A threesome. Three, a threesome. Yeah. That is a threes up dad film. <laughs> and in the end, oof, and she and the thing and the songs. And then I was such a wreck that I, I had to put, I, I had a hoodie with me. I had to, the, I stayed all the way through the credits, couldn't stop crying. Everyone left. The staff came in. Uh, and without being a dickhead, this was when Derek, I'm in the show Derek, it was when it was like most on the telly and it was the time I was like most being sort of recognised and I was like, oh, fuck. And I put a hoodie, wrapped it around my head <laughs> and sort of kept, went out like the elephant man. Because uh, <laughs> I thought, I look insane at the not getting up. like, And then just <laughs> shuffling out. <Okay. laughs> three dads, three dads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, terrible that. I mean, I've watch really a film, though. Never I've watch it again. <laughs> Go on. Have you never watched it again? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've called you twice in the past... Uh, this is actually in the last couple of years. Yeah. I've called you twice, three times, actually, but twice immediately after I've walked out of films yeah. because I needed to talk to you about how much I cried. Yeah. Uh, it was the Florida Project <laughs> yes. and Roma. Yeah. I had to call you after the Florida Project. Yeah. At least with Roma, when I saw Roma, everybody in the cinema was distraught. And yeah. so it was like, it really did feel like it was fine to walk out. The Florida Project, I went to see it with, no offence, a pack of fucking animals. <laughs> who at the end stood up and went, yeah, that was fine. Ooh. That was not what? fine! What happened? 
that in that movie was not it was not okay what happened. It was horrible. We went for a walk together, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. we really did. When you called, I was like, he's seen the Florida Project. <laughs> I was in a meeting, I was like, sorry guys. <laughs> Nish has just seen the, the Florida Project. I walked across land, I found him, we held each other. <laughs> it's, right. su- it's such a weird relationship. I did it with if Beale Street could talk as well, but that yeah. at least that was like, I'd seen that in the afternoon. Roma and the Florida Project, I did it, at, I, I walked out and phoned Brett because I was in such a bad way. And, and then we saw Marriage Story together. Now, here's the thing. We saw Marriage Story together. Brave boys. Uh, <laughs> brave boys, because we were next to each other. And it ended, and uh, what Nish said to me was, let's never let our partners see that film. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yeah, how was... are we going to pretend it doesn't exist? <laughs> it's on Netflix. And so I have changed the password, uh, and no one needs to know. <laughs> and whenever people say marriage story, I go, yes, tell us your marriage story. <laughs> and <laughs> hope it covers it. It was... Yeah, marriage story is if you're it, it's not it's not great when a film throws all of your negative qualities into one character <laughs> and you can't even offset them by saying, Well, at least I look like Adam Driver. <laughs> like the only thing that I've got in common with Adam Driver is we both have what can politely be deemed interesting schnozzes. <laughs> Couple of absolute odd schnozzes between me and, and the drive meister. But apart from that, very little common ground. Um, What's your film that made you cry the most? So Just this is the thing. These are, I'm weeping constantly. Yeah. Cried through Inside Out. Yeah, you know. Bing well. Bong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Of when course. Bing Bong goes off the edge. Forget it. That's one of the worst things I've ever seen. Yeah. Toy Story 3 when they're going to Bing the incinerator. Bong. Bing Bong going off the edge is worse than the two people landing face first in a <laughs> spike. It is. A hundred, hundred percent. It is. More traumatic. It than really that. is. Because at the end, you're like, oh, well, they were part of a weird cult. What yeah. did Big Bong do? <laughs> Nothing. Big Bong was innocent. Big Bong was trying to. Big Bong did it to save Riley. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> amazingly, none of those are the film. The film that I think made me cry at the time and has made me cry every single time I've watched it is Arrival. I think the last five minutes of Arrival should carry their own specific... Like, there should be a bit where the film stops and they go, are you sure you want to see the rest of this? <laughs> are you 100% sure that you want to see the rest of this Do film? Do you know that Brett is free to talk if, <laughs> in five minutes' time? I, the end of Arrival, and people who have children... I, I was just talking to a friend of mine who has kids, and I was like, I don't know how you got through the end of Arrival. She was like, I, d- I didn't. I had a nervous breakdown. And here's one of the weird things, is that I have noticed, there was a time when I was, I'm a, we're stand-up comedians, I spent a lot of time on tour in hotel rooms with the internet. And what you do... Where you can there, watch DVDs. Yeah. <laughs> Famously. It's like Blockbuster, but it's in the air. <laughs> I have noticed a weird habit where I get drunk and watch the end of Arrival... Wow. Like I'm masturbating my emotions. Wow. It is one of those things. Listen, I He's am fine. going to be in therapy from January, okay? <laughs> it, is, it is a really weird thing. The end of that, I think that whole film is absolutely perfect. I think the last five minutes are one of the... Who has seen Arrival just by a show of hands? Oh, who good. Keep your hands in the air if you saw the end coming. You knew what the, the essential twist was going to be. Right, okay. Because I that would have really helped me the fuck out. Because <laughs> I didn't see that coming. And, the, and it, the force of the ending of that hit me like a fucking train. And when you realise what's... You, there's a point where it essentially... It, the line when she says, but who is that girl? Mm. I, from then on, like I was like, oh. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, Christ. And the sort of choice that Amy Adams' character... Amy Adams, greatest actor of all time. I won't hear anything. I don't even want to hear a counter-argument to that. Mm. You can all go fuck yourselves. <laughs> the last... The, but the way that... The choice that she makes at the end of that movie is, pro- is the most unbelievably human thing I think I've ever seen in a movie. Like, the choice that she makes to know how things are going to play out mm. and still make the decision that she makes. Would you do it? I d- honestly don't know. Hmm. I honestly don't know. It's how I don't even know how you wrap 
your mind around the enormity of that idea. That if you knew that you were going to have a child and that they were going to be sick and they were going to suffer, do you still make the choice to have... Like, it's... it's it, I mean, it's... I'm, I have to stop talking about it because otherwise I don't want to cry in front of these people. <laughs> They've paid. Maybe it's time. <laughs> Maybe it's time, this. <laughs> January's still far away. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, the whole film is. I I rewatched it for the, because I w we were talking about this, and there's there's stuff in Arrival. The way that it handles the science fiction element of it. There's oh, a one good. line in it that is unreal, where you get it's one exchange, and you get the backstory of two characters immediately. When he says. Uh, to when Forrest Whitaker, who's an army general, comes in and sees Amy Adams, and they've met before, and they explain how they've met before by him saying, uh, she's a linguistics expert, he says, you made short work of that rebel dialect. She says, you made short work of those rebels. And you're like, wow, I know every single thing about both of these characters and how they relate to each other and interact in one two-line exchange. And so you're like, of course, a, a person with that level of sort of, of course a group of people making a film with that level of skill can sell you on octopus aliens <laughs> called Abbott and Costello <laughs> and it somehow be the purest evocation of what it means to be a parent. <laughs> Fucking right. Yeah, clap it. Well, clap it. Um, what is the film that uh, you love but most people don't like? Or, to put it a nicer way, the most underrated film in your... There's a few uh, that I think are a bit... There's a few films that I think are slightly... The, two, the film that I have the most arguments with people about is not the one I'll say. The film that I have the most arguments with people about is Inherent Vice, which for some reason people seem to absolutely hate. Who? But, uh, Show me. Loads of people hate... Do, does anyone in here hate Inherent Vice? Yeah. Uh, people hate Inherent Vice! You're very wrong. <laughs> um, I really love Spy. I think that's an incredible movie, and I think that it's, for me, it's like one of the great comedies of the last 20 years. But the film that I will say is not necessarily one that's underrated, because in order for it to be underrated, it would have to be rated. Right. I think this is a movie that people have forgotten exists. But in 2010, uh, they, Alex Garland adapted Kazuo Ishiguro's novel, Never Let Me Go. And it came out and sort of died a death. I think, it is a, I think it's really, really worth going back and re there's people in the front row who are like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, genuinely, it died a death. It has an incredible cast. It's, um, uh, it's got Spider-Man. Sp Spider-Man. Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> both yeah. Spider -Man, both, Pride both and Prejudice. the worst two versions of those things. <laughs> yeah. It's got Andrew Garfield, Kira Knightley, and Kerry Mulligan. An it's, education. Yeah, an education. Lovely. It's directed by Mark Romanek, who's made lots of very celebrated music videos. And it's adapted by <laughs> Alex Garland, who went on to make... Um, Ex Machina. Uh, Ex Machina and Annihilation. Both great movies. And it, it, it really is like... It, it, the, I think the reason it struggled is because the poster makes it look fucking boring. <laughs> <laughs> like, if you look at the... If you, that yeah. movie, it's just two people. That is actually the more interesting of the two posters. There's just two people sort of running on a pier and you think, fuck me. Uh, the other poster is just this like red nonsense with loads of squares of them sort of holding each other's faces. Oh. And I think part of the problem and the reason that this movie, and, and I wouldn't, I, this one I won't spoil because I truly think not enough people have even heard of it for me to get into it. It is almost impossible to explain what this film is about without ruining some of it. It looks like a totally shit boring Hollywood parody of a British film. Like, it looks like the sort of film where people go, oh, yeah, it's a British movie. It's to people talking in a kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> and then at the end, they run down a pier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the end, they run down a pier. And Look we're out that's to supposed see. to mean something for some reason. Yeah. Oh, Christ. But it's a completely brilliant film. Whatever you think it is, it is not that. The novel is really very sort of widely fated. People really love the novel. It is the... It is a science fiction film in the truest sense of the word. It's science fiction in the way that Arrival is science fiction. Like, it's the purest distillation of what that means. But to say any more would be to spoil the film. And it's, it's amazing because all, I think it's the best performances any of them have given. And they're, they're such talented actors. And the kind of the sort of supporting cast is amazing. Charlotte Rampling is in it. Um, Sa uh, what's, is it Sally Potter? The girl who's in Happy Go Lucky. Oh, Sally Hawkins. Sally Hawkins. Sally Hawkins is in it, and she sort of has this speech halfway through where you're like, wow, okay, because that it sort of explains what the film's about, and it t totally takes you by surprise. It's a really beautifully written and performed thing. 
the tone of it is really nicely managed. And it's just a real shame because it, it, there's no way to explain what it is without... Uh, Phantom Thread is another film that I think ma was made to look shit by the publicity materials. Uh, but I think oh, yeah. it's really difficult to publicize a film without spoiling it. And this is a movie that ultimately, I think, got fucked by its publicity. And also because it's an adaptation of a seemingly unfilmable novel. I imagine people who like the novel thought, well, I'm obviously not going to see that because it's going to be really bad because how could you possibly film something this complicated? Uh, but I would really urge you all to check it out. I think it's really great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> What's yours? Uh, well, I, I, would I got two. Well, I got two, but I'll do them quick. Uh, one is uh, The Last Exorcist. Do you see that? Anyone see that? It's a horror film, found footage thing about a geezer who does exorcisms. And he says, like, follow me. He's decided he's going to be good. He's, he's sort of like, I've been tricking people. And he goes, come with me. I'm going to do a fake exorcism. You'll see how it works. And he takes this documentary crew and goes to see this girl who thinks she's possessed by the devil. He doesn't believe in nothing. And he sees the girl, and it's quite scary. She's a bit scary, but he sort of figures out, oh, it's all bullshit because she's doing something over here. And then he leaves. And then he gets a phone call saying, uh, my daughter's, like, being weird again. And he goes back, and the daughter's, like, doing a fucking spider walk. And he's like, oh, oh, oh a bit like that. And, um, oh, that's part two. There's a part two! <laughs> well, I mean, part... Here's your first problem, Brett. <laughs> I'm doing this on the trade's descriptions. The Last Exorcist Part 1. <laughs> Very good point. Do you think the film got slightly compromised because it's a bold play if you make a horror film mm. and say The Exorcist in the yeah. title? Also, well, I, I, I made a film called Super Bob. The thing, little a fun fact. A great film. Oh, thank you very much. But little fun fact you may not know, The Last Exorcist is one of the biggest influences on Super Bob. What? Was, yeah. Because the structure of uh, The Last Exorcist is basically man says no to something, like, like oh, I've done an exorcist, but it's not real. Yeah. He gets called back, listen, mate, it is real. He goes back, he says, no, it's not real. And then he goes back, and then he's like, oh, shit got real. <laughs> and in Super Bob, he has to shake her hand. He says, no. Then Act right. 2 happens. He says, no. And then he has to shake everyone's <laughs> hand. <laughs> That's the structure of The oh, Last really? Exorcist. Yeah. Uh, my I other feel film. It's, a, it's to my, it speaks to my lack of skill because I moderated one of the Q&As for Super Bob and I didn't really get past that. <laughs> Most of my questions were, Brett, you made a film! <laughs> Your face was massive! Such a big old head as it, as it is. Yeah. Um, is there a question at the end of this? Yeah! What the fuck? <laughs> that is genuinely what he asked. Um, <laughs> my other one is Batman versus Superman, Dawn of Justice. Now... This what, film, Brett, now, by the way. I walked off, so help me God, I am coming back because of our friendship. This is, is one of the shittest things I've ever seen. If, sure, if you don't like German expressionistic <laughs> art cinema, which is what it is. This is not, how is Batman versus Superman? <laughs> German expressionistic art cinema. Because tell me that at any point it makes sense. <laughs> tell me that you're not watching it. Like, I went to see it. I wasn't going to see it because everyone said it was shit. And then one day I was like, I'll go. And I went to the IMAX. And I was like, I cannot believe this exists. Uh, it's the maddest thing I've ever seen. Nothing makes sense. It is as if he got to the... What I think happened is in the <laughs> Avid, he was in the edit suite, he made the film. He said, it's ready to go. Press print. But instead of pressing print, he pressed random shuffle. <laughs> and all the scenes got put in a different order. And they went, oh, fuck. And he went, oh, it's too late. It's the release date. We've got to put it out. And they put it out. Scenes follow scenes in a way There's your brain no can't compute. So it makes your brain Half the do movie stuff. is a dream. As much of Batman versus Superman is a dream sequence as Inception, which is set in dreams. But the greatest thing about Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, and sorry to spoil this, but Batman and Superman have a fight. Now, you may not, you may not know this, but making films is hard. It's really hard. And when it's a film like this, this is over 100 million. There's so much at stake. There are so many execs. There are so many meetings that have to happen. What happened was there was a meeting, and it was agreed by everyone that the solution to Batman and Superman having a fight is that as they're fighting, one of them says something Martha, and he says, why did you say Martha? 
And he goes, that's my mum's name. And Batman goes, fuck off, that's my mum's name. <laughs> and then they make up. That is the resolution of the that's film. That's it. What happened in the meeting? Who is in that meeting who is so scary that everyone went, yeah, that sounds good. It doesn't... It that literally, makes sense, it doesn't, actually. It Martha, doesn't make any what? sense. Also, my mum is called Vivian. If I was fighting someone and they said, my mum's called Vivian, I'd be like, so what? And I'd hit them. I wouldn't go, hang on, mate, hang on. Wait, 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 wait. Vivian, E-N-N-E. <laughs> Come on, let's go for a beer. That, that is, is that extraordinary is cinema. Also, can I ask you this, Brett? Yeah, you may. What film is Jesse Eisenberg in? He is in Dash... D Dash... <laughs> Dash Batman das versus Gordon. Dash Superman. <laughs> yeah. They're, They're all Shoot in different films. Batman with two ends and Superman. <laughs> I, Jesse Eisenberg plays Lex Luthor like he's a 90s game show host. Love it. Right. I'm slightly worried that we're going quite... I mean, are you all all right? Because we're, we're... I mean, I don't want to keep you uh, three years. Um, so let's try and... We'll, we'll crack on. Um, what is uh, the... Uh, do you want to do this one? All right. The film that means the most to you uh, this decade because of the experience you had seeing it. Okay, don't get angry with me. Uh oh. All of you. But Avengers Endgame. This is your. This yeah, is this is actually. Yeah, this is a demographic that I haven't seen. Avengers Endgame. Here's the thing, right? Obviously, there's. this. I think so many things about what Martin Scorsese said about Marvel films. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, there's, there's so much that I think about it, largely because I think, you know. First of all, people who get very defensive of them. You don't need to defend these things. They've made a trillion dollars. They're, it's the end industry. game. Oh, yeah. Is this some sort of weird off-brand? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it was just called Endgame. Is this Endgame. a fake one? I think we've got a fake we've poster on screen. We've got this a pirate version. Like, this looks like one of those things that's printed on a T-shirt that you buy outside <laughs> a gig venue. It's like Avengers with two Vs. Yeah. And it's Chris Bemsworth. What the <laughs> yeah, fuck? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love the incredible bulk. <laughs> go um, on, go I on. I think tell so us. many things about this. I think that um, regardless of what level of stature you get to, your opinions shouldn't be carried without impunity. However, on the other hand, it's Martin Scorsese. And if it's about film, he can say whatever the fuck he wants, right? I, I, really, I really think that he's, he's earned the right to say whatever he wants about anything. And I do, I love the Marvel movies, but I do sort of agree that they they aren't necessarily cinema. I think you have to approach them more as a massive TV box set. And certainly the way that they're run in terms of Kevin Feige being a kind of showrunner is closer to the model of a TV show. Now, that being said, I, I, you know, and the TV show, and it allows certain directors to come in and in a very self-contained way do really interesting things. Like, uh, I think the first Avengers movie is a really great, it's like the Magnificent Seven, but they're all in space. I think Thor Ragnarok is one of the funniest films of the last 10 years. And I think Black Panther is an extraordinary superhero film that somehow managed to like confront colonialism in a way that films about colonialism have managed to not do. It's such, it, it's a, it, there's, people can do really interesting things and they have this showrunner and it, it all works out. Now, all of that being said, the ex I saw Avengers Endgame at 7 a.m. on the day it came out with three of my friends, and we had a combined age of 130. <laughs> and the experience of seeing it, regardless of how I feel about this, I think it's a sort of I think it's sort of an extended TV show. I think this sort of universe. I'm not convinced it's damaging for cinema because at the end of the day it's good to get people in the fucking cinema. And it also is encourage, It also is giving platforms to some really interesting writers and directors. And if people go and see Thor Ragnarok and end up watching Boy or The Hunt for the Wilder People or What We Do in the Shadows, or if people who like Black Panther end up seeing Fruitvale Station, then that, it surely is to be welcomed in some way, right? And, but that sitting in that room, when the portals open and feeling a room full of people cheering. It was a moment of a collective experience that is surely part of the reason you fall in love with cinema. Like you fall in love with cinema for a lot of different reasons, for the capacity of film to sort of shape your emotions and change the way that you see the world. But also part of the thing that we love about cinema is the collective experience. And when 
when Black Panther came through the portal, two adult men stood up and screamed, Wakanda forever. <laughs> and like, there was something about that and the, joy, the pure joy that everyone felt in that moment that is, is inherently cinematic and is, you, you, you watch television in your, on your own. You experience it on your own and then you talk about it the next day in the office or wherever you people work. I don't have a real job. You talk <laughs> about it in, when you're in flying your biplanes, whatever jobs it is that you're doing these days, right? <laughs> or or, you, or more, more accurately, you go on the internet spend all your time on the internet, and then complain the story didn't make sense because you were on the internet. <laughs> but people, but the, the experience of cinema is designed to be a collective one. And when Avengers Endgame, when I watched Avengers Endgame and had the experience of seeing... Also, I use the Marvel Cinematic Universe as an escapism. And that, again, is sort of part of cinema. Like, I love the fact that you can go to a movie and it can be incredibly moving and incredibly powerful. And I also love that you can go to a movie where... a space robot is friends with a sassy raccoon. Like, I, mm. that's part of the reason you sort of fall in love with cinema is that it's, it's, it's art and it's entertainment. It's high culture and it's low culture. And so, I, and over the last 10 years, I have used the MCU to s escape reality when the internet when the full force of the right-wing press <laughs> descends on me because someone threw bread at me, and somehow that's <laughs> apparently my fault. And so I, I don't really delineate that these characters are characters. Now, when, when Tony Stark gets off the ship and he's ill, I'm not seeing Iron Man. I'm going, what's happened to my friend? <laughs> what's, what's, what they, what's everyone done to my January's friend? January's quite far <laughs> away. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> But the experience of seeing it the first time, and then I went back and saw it because just through proxy, my girlfriend has become infected by these fucking movies. And so I went back and saw it with her the second time, and I, I still thought it was a really fun film, but the second time the audience wasn't, you know, it wasn't day one, 7 a.m. And so it didn't quite have... Also, it, I don't know how else to say this. There's not a whole lot of entertainment that's made for brown people like, at all. And the fact that... Black Panther exists. Black Panther is the closest thing to me as a superhero. And I am not black. <laughs> That's just the way culture has gone. And so there is, that is, you know, that is, there is something extremely cool about that. And for some weird reason, somebody had sent a memo out, memo out on the BAME WhatsApp groups, and it was an unbelievably non-white screening. It was an anti-midsummer of a room. <laughs> And it was like, it was, there was a real energy to it and there was a real excitement in experiencing that film, not on my own at home, but with a group of my friends and a group of strangers that sort of did go some way to remind me of why I love movies. I mean, I'd probably, i say, yeah, I'd say clap it. What's yours? Um, my answer is equally highbrow. I, um, I was, this was a long time ago, I was dating, I was dating this woman and we hadn't been, we been, I don't know, not been long. And, uh, and it was like, how many dates is it till you go to the cinema? It's like, you, you know what I mean? Like third? Well, for you, it's, it's 50. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, we had to meet, I had a gigs, whatever. I had to meet her very late. I had to meet her at midnight. We were going to go to the cinema. It was the first time we'd been to cinema together. It's a big test, you know, because if this goes bad, we'll never be together. And if you talk, we'll never be together. <laughs> it's like, it's risky. But I took it, uh, we were going to see, I can't remember what we were going to see, but it was something proper. I'd done my read. I was like, we're going to go see yeah. a good film. And we got there and we had missed it. We had missed a good film. And the only film that was left to see was That's My Boy. Uh, <laughs> now that's, That's My Boy is Adam Sandler's worst reviewed film of all time. It has 0% on, <laughs> on Rotten Tomatoes. The premise of That's My Boy is the, the joke premise is that he was, uh, he had his teacher, played by Susan Sarandon, had sex with him when he was a child. And because he's a boy and she's Susan Sarandon, he's a legend. And he grows up to be, and everyone in the town high fives him all the time. You're the guy who fucked Mrs. Whatever. That is the premise of That's My Boy. Uh, it's a sort of comedy about paedophilia. Anyway. <laughs> So I was like, I don't think... She, and she was like, well, that's the only thing. On, let's go. And I was like, I'm so sorry. We went to see it. She was on the floor. <laughs> she couldn't 
believe how funny it was. She was like this, uh, up and down, laughing, rolling around. Reader, I married her. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, but it really made me, it really made me like, oh, this is fun, isn't it? You don't have to, why, why are we all such, you know, maybe this is fun. Anyway, it was a lovely time. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> what what a sweet story that comes in from one of the most horrible stories <laughs> in the Western canon. <laughs> it's quite something. It's absolutely, it's awful. Yeah. No, well, come on. Um, <laughs> right. I, we are, listen, we're going to have to skip some yeah, of these. Yeah, yeah. Let's do, I guess, why everyone's here. Uh, what's the sexiest film of the decade? Luckily, now, can I go first? Yeah. Uh, it's Wiener. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> No, our answer is the same. I yeah, believe. it's the same. It's uh, hustlers. Yeah. It's hustlers. That's not. Let's not. Let's not let's fuck not. around. It's J Lo. It's her butt. Hey, it's not just her butt. <laughs> it's her L face <laughs> and her hair <laughs> and her legs and her smile. <laughs> it's. I mean, it's. It is iconic. Like it's immediately like as an as a character intro. That is absolutely iconic. Have you seen Hustlers? I mean, fuck it. It's now. really good. It's really good. It's really good on every level, and it's so good that it's really good on every level, so you can justify <laughs> seeing it. <laughs> and fucking hell. 50. She's 50. I love her. Now. <laughs> she also, the first time you see her do the pole dance, and then the next time you see her is when she, she's up on the roof. And she's yeah. just wearing a fur coat yeah. and smoking. And you're like, oh, God, I think I want need to lie down. <laughs> now, in fact, uh, w uh, one of the questions on here is best cuddle. And one of my answers for best cuddle yeah. is Hustlers. Is there's a scene on the roof. She's sat in a big fur coat. And the girl, the new girl, comes up and she's shy. And Jennifer Lopez gives her a cuddle in a big fur coat. Like, puts her between her legs, like, cuddles her. And I thought, I've never wanted to be cuddled more. <laughs> Yeah. Like that is the, one of the best cuddles. I think uh, about that twice a day. <laughs> like, it really is like, What's sometimes, especially when you're like, it's cold at the moment. If you're out in the street, it's just really cold, and you're like, oh, I just wish JLo would wrap me in a big coat. <laughs> Give me one of your special cuddles. <laughs> yeah. um, now, there's a subcategory troubling, bone, worrying, why done of the decade. Well, I have a sort of weirdly, I love Spider Man and have loved Spider-Man <coughs> since I was a child. Go on. I have found it very difficult, I have found it very difficult to accept a sexy Aunt May. I found it very difficult to accept, because to me, Aunt May is like, is, you know, it's not Marissa to my, uh, but she's great. But the real troubling boner, and I feel very bad about this, the real troubling boner is Amy Adams in American Hustle, who I think, after I saw that, I was like, that is one of the sexiest performances I have ever seen in a movie. And then afterwards, I read this really horrible interview where she had said she had a really bad time on that film, and she was crying the whole time. And I was just looking at my boner being like, you piece of shit. You absolute, how dare you become aroused when the greatest actor of all time oh, is having dear. a difficult couple of months at work. Yeah. And so it's not so much troubling as it is guiltiest boner <laughs> that I've experienced. Uh, mine is uh, under the skin. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, fuck off, you lying, <laughs> lying sack of pricks. You know what he's talking about. Scarlett Johansson is obviously very beautiful and she lures, lures men into her, her minivan. And I think, yeah, I'd get in. And then she... <laughs> <laughs> and then she takes them to her weird house that's just got gunk everywhere and, and, and the men seem to go, mm, that seems all right. <laughs> and, uh, and they walk into the, to the gunk and I'm like, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and then in the end, it turns out she doesn't have uh, insides or uh, an anything and I still fancy her. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound like you're very troubled by this bone of yeah. Well... The canter just trying to be open. <laughs> well, I listen. I know. I, I know exactly what you mean. And anyone <laughs> who was making a shrieking noise is lying to themselves. Right, because we are pushed for a time. Let's pick 
Do you want to do? Uh, you, you could. Do you want to do worst film? Do you want to be negative? We could something? do it quickly. No, let's not do worst. No, look, we could do no. it quick. All right, quickly say it, and then we'll move on. War Dogs. It's a bag of shit, and Todd Phillips is a bad director. <laughs> okay, uh, mine is uh, The Counselor, uh, written by Cormac McCarthy. That is so bad that it made me think maybe Cormac McCarthy <laughs> can't write, and and all the novels I'd read of it, I was like, maybe they are shit. Uh, there's dialogue in The Counselor. Every single line is like. The way is hard, hard way. The way, we, the way we walk is the way we run, because to run is to get in the way uh, of Jamila Jamil's eyeway. We weigh each other in our <laughs> wayness. It's bad. There is a bit in War Dogs, and this is all I will say about it, at the end, when two characters are arrested, and as they're being arrested in slow motion, it plays behind blue eyes by The Who. So as they're being arrested, you just hear, no one knows what it's like to be a bad man. And I openly laughed. <laughs> um, best cuddle we've done, but there's more. Do you want to do one more? One best cuddle? One more? I got one. We, Go on. Well, I'll say the same one as yours because I think it is probably the best cuddle. Uh, shoplifters. Yeah. Shoplifters. I talk about it a lot. I mean, you've I mean, right. you've right. I mean, it's just the best. Little girl. They've got this little girl. They've sort of got this little girl, adopted her, and the mum is cuddling her. It's similar pose to the J Lo <laughs> yeah. pose. And she sees she has uh, scars on her arm, this, this little girl. And she says to her, uh, I know you think perhaps you were taught that that is what love is, but that isn't what love feels like. And she cuddles her and she says, that is what love feels like. Oh, boy. Unbelievable. Absolutely oh boy. incredible. Absolutely unbelievable. What a film. All right, let's do... Okay, let's do greatest, because here's the thing. I was thinking about the greatest, not the favourite, the greatest. Yeah. Like objectively, what is the greatest film of the decade? And the answer came to me, and it hit me hard, and I was annoyed by it because <laughs> I don't even like this film. <laughs> I don't like what it did to me. I never want to see it again, but I'm like, it is the greatest film of the decade. I'm genuinely annoyed that it is, but I think it's Inside Out. I think Inside Out, conceptually... Talk me through, talk me through it. Because it, if you look at everything, it is un believably profound. It is literally a film that talks about the human psyche, why we have depression, why sadness is important and not to fight it, the little girl in it, the damage that is done by the dad saying, by the mum saying, you need to be a brave girl for daddy, the th that, that fucks her up for life, that all these things that make up our brain, the conceptualization of a baby and in her head there is one button in the brain and then those buttons grow as light. I mean, it's... Fucking incredible when you think about it. I With all the things in your head doing all that work. I don't know that there's ever been a film that's ever depicted human consciousness yeah. like in that way. It is unbelievably... Th yeah, the, the idea at the end, Bing Bong had absolutely ruined me. Yeah. But then when he's sort of like, oh, sadness is a really important part of life. Yeah. You're like, Jesus, are you sure we should be telling children this? Yeah. Like, it's it this. really... And the, 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 the sort of twist of like all those memories you saw, but oh actually they God. were all these happy memories, but there was sadness in them. And like, I'll say this, I'll fucking say it here because January soon, like it helped me. It helped yeah, my mental yeah. health because I think I spent a lot of time thinking it has to be joy all the time, it has to be joy all the time. Any other emotion means I am failing or I am not well. And this film said, no, you need that shit to balance everything out. And I was like, fuck you, Pixar. <laughs> Yeah. No, you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. I'm annoyed, but it is. I, I mean. What's your one? You can't top inside out. <laughs> I'll see your inside out, okay. and I'll raise you a baby dice, Roma. <laughs> I think Roma is. I think if I it's if I had to good. answer the question of greatest, yeah. I really feel like. Just on every level, I think the characters and the performances are extraordinary. The whole thing you could, I, I maintain you could print Roma out frame by frame and hang it in a gallery. Every shot is a work of art. Every character feels fully realized. Mm -hmm. And the one weird thing that I've heard is people say, oh, I really li I liked Roma. I sort of really admired it, but it didn't really do anything for me emotionally. I could see looking at it. I th Those people need to be on some sort of register because <laughs> it's sort of the most, I, I don't know, like I, it, it, it was such an odd thing to be experiencing something that's so aesthetically beautiful and so 
precise in the way that it's composed and the shot list, but also to realize it's absolutely smashed you in the gut. And the end, the, that final scene, well, not the final scene, the scene in the water when she goes into the water. Unbelievable. How do they do it? How do they do it? I don't, do it? It's amazing. It's incredibly shot. But it, what's incredible about it is it's only in retrospect you go, wow, it's amazing that they managed to... But because yeah. at the time, it, they've already killed a baby. Yeah, Why think... wouldn't all the characters die? Yeah. And so it is sheer terror at that last... And it, uh, there's a part of me that thinks the poster that they've shown shouldn't exist in a way because it sort of gives away the fact that it survives, uh, that people survive. But honestly, that was the only thing I clung to <laughs> yeah. when I was watching it because I was sick with terror. And then I was like, I, s I thought, I think I've seen him on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be okay. I saw the they poster. They wouldn't make up a poster, I saw the they? poster. I saw the poster on the beach because it, the end is absolutely harrowing. I, I think the performances are extraordinary. I think the film looks like a work of art. I think if you're like, for me, greatest film of the decade, I think, for me, there was uh, there was only ever one answer. Yeah. Well, it's the wrong answer, but it is... <laughs> no, it's so close. It's so close. It's, it's number two, but Inside Out is the one. Um, uh, all right. I think, because of the time, we should uh, go to the audience. Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about that? Oh, quickly, favourite. Not greatest, favourite. Uh, favourite, get out. Favourite... The favorite, the favorite was favorite was get out because you know, I was really trying to sort of you you, you really try and it's, it's it's an impossible thing to try and assess like compare these different movies but if I think about what I love about movies get out was all of it it was everything that I love about film because I love the capacity that films have to make you discuss really complicated and difficult issues. I love the fact that you can go on a journey with characters and you know that the moment at the end when he's holding her by the throat and the red and blue lights flash and you felt an audience gasp and you felt an audience, I saw it in quite a mixed audience and when everyone, when the people who aren't black in the room, when we gasp, you suddenly go, fuck me, that has shifted Something He's done it. about that it's communicated something so potent and powerful about the African American experience. It's done something so incredible, but also it's so fucking entertaining. It's a proper thrill ride. It's so funny. The speech that culminates in the phrase "That's Jeffrey Dahmer's business" is as funny as anything. T.S. motherfucking A. Like, it's, everything has, like, it's even, you know, it, every single element of it is so entertaining. The uh, script is brilliant. The performances are incredible. And uh, I, if we did this podcast two more times, I would vote for Get Out a third time if I could. I think it's the absolute, my favourite, my favourite, favourite, favourite. Love it. Love it. Um... And my favourite is The Florida Project, uh, oh. which is, uh, well, we, you know, if you haven't seen it, sort, sort yourselves out. Please see um, The Florida Project. It's, it's so really fucking good. Film. And I think it's important. Cinema, what it showed me, that thing of, it's like humanitarian, what's the word? Humanistic. Humanistic. Yeah. Is that you watch uh, a, a world that you don't know, that you have not experienced. And, and I've said this, the... I once went on a course for writing. I didn't learn much, but there was one thing that he said that always stuck with me. He said, a writer has to love all of their characters, no matter who their characters are. So if you're writing Hitler, you, the writer, have to love Hitler. It doesn't mean your character's a good person, but you have to love them. Florida Project is a perfect example of someone making a film where he loves everyone. There's so much love and patience and respect for all of these characters in this Anyway, fuck me, it's good. It's <laughs> Go and really see it. Good. I saw it. I couldn't believe it. I went back. I went back because it some happens rarely where you're like, I think that might be one of the top ten greatest films I've ever seen. Yeah. Am I wrong? And I went back two days later. I was like, No, I'm not wrong. Thank <laughs> you. 